How old were you when you started the brand TBH? I was 23. 23. So year one, 650,000 in the year, mm. year four, which we've just finished, and that was over 10 million. Congratulations, that eight figure club. That's amazing. What a journey. Acne is the eighth most prevalent disease worldwide. I personally suffered with acne for upwards of 13 years. Whether you're on TikTok, whether you're on Instagram, you've got a highly visual product. You've got somebody with acne there before, and you've got somebody with beautiful skin sitting right next to it. And we look at the branding and we look at the Instagram and it's, it's beautiful. You've done such an amazing job. Where did that start? Who helped you with that? How did you come up with this idea? Yeah, basically. That so many perfectionists listening to this, they never have the opportunity to look back with regret because they never started in the first place. So you just put together a pitch deck, you went in to see the CEO of this publicly traded company at 23 and pitched you yeah. out, out. Yeah, very naively. How did you do it? So. What's up guys, welcome to this podcast. This is an absolute ripper. In this podcast, as you saw in the trailer, we have Rachel Wild of TBH Skincare a company that recently merged with another skincare company and is now doing over $20 million a year out of Sydney. Rachel was only 23 years old when she co-founded the company with her mum. And this is the incredible story of how they did it. She was so open at every turn of her journey. She talked about doing family and friends fundraising. She talked about going and doing some crowdfunding she talked about how she got introduced to the company that she ultimately merged with and how those synergies multiplied when they put the two companies together by four to five X. It's an amazing story. It's extremely detailed. Rachel was very, very open about how she got her products into Priceline, how she got it into Coles, over 1,200 retail outlets around the country. She shared the split between how much of her money comes from her e-commerce store versus what comes in for retail, why she embraced the retail path, whereas many e-com sellers try to avoid it to maintain margin and everything. It's really, really good. And I think you guys are going to absolutely love this podcast. So without further ado, let's jump in and get into it. Here's a fun fact about our show. We put a ton of effort into making these podcasts for you. The one thing that we would love for you to do if you actually get value out of the pod is just hit that subscribe button. By doing that, it helps us get better guests on the show because they can see that we have a bigger audience. So if you're enjoying the content, just hit the subscribe button below and then throughout the podcast, drop a comment so that we know that we're hitting the mark or how we can improve. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the episode. What is up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of Unemployable. Today, we are joined virtually uh, all the way from Sydney with Rachel Wild, who is uh, very kindly agreed to come on and tell us this incredible story. If you are one of those people who aspires to build an awesome business, a sexy looking cool business, this is the podcast for you. And we always love not only when we get young entrepreneurs, but young female entrepreneurs as well, um, because it's not as common. And uh, you, you ladies certainly have a unique approach to things, which I think we can all learn from. Rachel, thank you for joining us on the pod. How are you doing? How's things down in Sydney? Yeah, not too bad. Probably not as sunny as up where you are, but it's not it's not too bad. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, up here it's cold today. It is like five degrees. Oh, really? It's only like for us, that's like <laughs> Arctic. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's probably about as cold as it ever gets. Yeah, that's right, it does. So thank you for joining us, James. What's going on, buddy? Welcome to the call. I just uh, shaking off that cold. It was a bit of a shock this morning. <laughs> I certainly didn't do the walk, the usual morning walk. I uh, drove to the gym instead, so um, that's a bit of a sign I'm turning into a... a, a Pussy. <laughs> <laughs> Harden up, sunshine. Eric, how you doing, mate? I'm very good, thank you. I'm uh, happy to be here and learn a little bit more about Rachel's story and how she started this thing. Yeah, we'll show this one to your daughters and maybe yeah. inspire them to be young female entrepreneurs as well. Definitely. Um, and uh, yeah, look, it's going to be a great pod and uh, we're, we're super excited to dive into this because you know, we're, we're hearing more and more of these um, young Aussie entrepreneurs that are, you know, you were really young when you started this, right, Rachel? How old were you when you started um, the brand TBH? I was 23 at the time. Wow. 23. So I'm going to ask the, probably the most obvious question that people ask all the time, TBH, what does it stand for? It stands for the biofilm hack. Um, obviously, we knew, though, that it was going to have the double meaning and the other connotation, of, to be honest, um, which we like. So it's a bit of a play on words. But it, yes, it actually stands for 
the biofilm hack and it describes the mechanism of action in the hero product. Yes. Well, let's talk about that because we always bang on as an entrepreneurial podcast about the importance of solving a real problem. Alex Almozi has a four point sort of checklist, really basic. There are four things you should check before you decide on a product or a service or launching a business. And the very first thing is, are you solving a real problem? You clearly are because you're solving acne as your hero product, your main product, which is affects mm -hmm. most teenage people, right? Like across the yeah. gender divide. So t t talk to us a little bit about the problem that you solve. And I love the story. I've read the stories in the press about you, but that how you pitched and got the technology that's now sort of underpinning this amazing product. So tell us about the, the market and, and the problem that you solve. Yeah, I'll start with the problem. I mean, acne is thought to, I think it's the eighth most pre prevalent disease worldwide. So it's a very common problem. I think at some point in your life, it's like 85 to 90% of the population suffer with it. So um, very common problem. And one that you know, there's a whole bunch of different treatment pathways for acne. Um, and I think I went through just about all of them when I was a teenager. So I personally suffered with acne for a very long time, upwards of 13 years. Um, I went through the very traditional pathway of, you know, sort of seeing a GP, getting prescribed different things. Um, and it was a very difficult experience for me to go through as a teenager. So I think, you know, um, I never really decided that I was going to start a business um, to solve that problem. When I was younger, I didn't really think that later on I would be building a business to solve that problem. That was never really the aim, but I definitely had that personal experience, which definitely came into handy when I found this technology. So um, aside from, you know, experiencing acne for a very long part of my teenage and early 20s life, I, you know, went on, I'd after school, I studied marketing. I actually ended up working in medical devices and that's what led me to um, finding the technology that ended up in the Hero product and was the whole reason that we decided to start the business. So um, through working in medical devices, I was lucky to be introduced to this company who had this technology that they were using in fighting like infections in hospitals. So there's a whole right, like really wide application of use um, for this technology in that hospital and medicated space, but it also had an application in skincare to treat acne. And when I heard about that, obviously I had that really personal experience with the problem. So I was almost selfishly interested in the in the product. And so started asking a few more questions. And long story short, my mum and myself went into business together. She's an amazing um, financial brain. She's an accountant by trade. And we actually decided this could be an incredible business opportunity. So we teamed up. I think I put together a pitch deck after hours, you know, um, of work in like two weeks. And then we went in um, with full startup cost modeling, everything, the brand um, concept. And we went and pitched for the licensing rights to that product to take it into skincare and bring it to market. And we were lucky enough to win them. Okay. So that's an amazing start to a podcast. I can't wait to dive a bit more into <laughs> just that piece because I've spent some time looking at your socials, which are amazing, by the way. Um, super engaging. I love how you really know your target audience. And I love all the cool promos you do. And from I've got so many notes I want to ask you about. But I think it's really important to unpack just that first step. So you came at this mm. because you had firsthand personal experience with a highly emotive product, right? Like yeah. when you suffer from acne, it doesn't matter how good looking you are. Um, it mm. really can like, you know, it's, yeah, it's a real problem. So, and you can't get away from it. It's right there on your face. So how did you discover it was a it was a ASX listed company, right? That had this technology. Yeah. How did you actually hear about that product? And then, when you say we had some bunch of discussions, how did you who who were you talking to inside of that company? How did you reach out? How did you make the meeting? Yeah. Because there's somebody here yeah. listening to this, and what are those practical steps to do that? Yeah, so we were actually meeting with the CEO of that company when we were pitching for the licensing rights. Now, going a step back before that, um, we I was, the company that I was working in was a distribution um, company. So that model is essentially um, finding tech and suppliers in the medical space and then taking and selling them in 
to hospital via like you're the distributor so you're taking those other brands and those other technologies so I think I had obviously understood how that whole world worked in terms of when a research and development company has a technology they're not necessarily the ones taking it to market they're working with third parties to sort of bring those technologies to market so that was sort of step one in me understanding that there was an opportunity there to bring that to market. Um, Getting the meeting was a very lucky circumstance in that I had actually a family connection into the CEO of that company. They worked together ages ago. And so he was able to introduce me and get me that meeting when I found out about the technology. Cool. So you just put together a pitch deck. You went in to see the CEO of this publicly traded company at 23 and pitched your heart out. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> yeah, very naively. Uh, were you nervous? You must have been shitting yourself. I think I was so excited um, and just like, yeah, very, I was definitely nervous. Don't get me wrong, very nervous. But I think, yeah, it was like that excitement um, that really took over in terms of my memory of that moment. Was the, was, the, was the pitch basically, were you pitching them for money as well to be the investor or were you just pitching them, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to launch this range of products which would have been, I guess, a, a an, an early version of what TBH is now. And then yeah. here we're just saying we'll pay you, is it a royalty or something that you pay for the technology? How does that deal actually work? What does that look like? Yeah. So initially with the distribution agreement, so essentially we're just buying the product off them to then sell it. Um, and so, yeah, there was no pitching for investment. They did not invest in the company at all at the start. That was up to us. It was up to us to set it up to brand it, to get the funding, to buy the stock, to manage the sales and meet sort of our minimum entitlements almost when we when we went into that agreement. So is that what the agreement looks like? There's a minimum order quantity that you have to satisfy in order to retain the rights? Do you, do you have to pay an upfront fee in a deal like that or is it just an ongoing you buy the goop off them? Like are you buying the liquid off them or are you manufacturing it under license? So... It was almost like a bit of a hybrid, actually, of that situation. So we were buying it off them, but we were then manu- managing the manufacturing relationships. And it has since sort of um, evolved. That partnership has evolved more into like a licensing agreement now. Um, and so that is typically what it looks like is you manage the manufacturing side and then you're paying the royalty on the tech. In terms of upfront payments for us at that time, there there weren't any, but I have seen other deals um, structured in that way where it is quite common that you would have an upfront payment for that tech that might be offset against future royalties um, that you have to pay. So there's a lot of ways that you can put together deals like that. Um, But yeah, that's how it happened for us. That's super interesting. Eric, how do you actually make a pitch deck for a publicly traded company? Where where, where did you start? How did you know what to put in it? Who helped you? Yeah. I literally, um, no one really helped me with that pitch deck, which is ridiculous to think about. I mean, I look back at that pitch deck now and it haunts me. It's so ugly. <laughs> and there's, yeah, there is so much that I would change about that pitch deck, but the benefit of hindsight, and obviously having some more experience under my belt now. Um, honestly, I just, um, I think it's how I approach most things when I'm not sure what to do is just like, what do I, yeah, what is the things that I need to get across? What are the questions I need to answer here? And what are the practicalities of, you know, how it would actually work? And I think we, a lot of the time it's more simple than it actually appears. You know, there's something, there's a win in it for you, the person who's pitching it. There's also a win in it for the company that you're pitching to. And um, you've sort of just got to display, I guess, how, you see that vision working and that was my main my main goal with the pitch deck was when I put it together, I really sold the vision for the brand and the target audience and how it was going to be different in market and all the things that we thought we could do with bringing, bringing that product to market. Yeah. So, so you've got this product that is underpinned by um, science and that's the, that's the thing, isn't it? Like when you're working in a market, you, the hard part is getting – something that's different, something you need, you basically were able to leverage the investment of a publicly traded company in this unique technology and get the rights to distribute it, which is super, super clever. And it gives you kind of a moat around your business. Yeah. And that sort of has held up over time, right? Like, cause you can't copy mm. um, what they've developed, which is amazing. So yeah. I, I think it was Elon Musk that said, if you were going 
uh, if you look back at, at, at iterations and you're not embarrassed, then you're moving too slow. And, and I think that's yeah. very true, right? Like so many perfectionists listening to this, um, they're, they're stuck in paralysis analysis and they never have the opportunity to look back with regret because they never started in the first place. And so yeah. many entrepreneurs are sort of like ready, fire, aim. Um, <laughs> whereas others, it's like ready, 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 aim, aim, aim. And they never <laughs> actually fire. And you got to take your shot, right? Yeah, it's so true. Yeah. So, so okay. So you 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 get this licensing agreement signed, um, and you got your mum as your sidekick. How much money did you do you two put together to actually kick this off? And was it private funding, or did you then go around and try and raise some money? So we raised money amongst family and friends. It was a small round at the start, um, and then we put in our own money as well. So all up, it was about 250000 And then from day one, we also took out a bank overdraft of about 120000 Okay. So you did get your friends and family around to help you out and do a little yeah. s- small offer to get some funding. Yeah. And where does the funding go for people who've got no idea? Um, if you, if you, if, by the way, guys, if you haven't looked up the website by now, um, please do look it up while, while you have this pod playing in the background. It's TBH skincare.com t for tom b for barry h for hudson uh skincare.com and just see what we're talking about it's a beautiful website and you can see that it's just been done absolutely properly so where does this 250 grand go when you're first starting out where did you spend money stock number one um because if you're in a product-based business that investment in stock is hefty Um, and you're locked into minimum order requirements. So, you know, you're investing in, you know, 5,000 units minimum at a time. And it's not just sort of that bill cost, you're also outlaying for packaging. So, the lead time on those items is really long, which means from a cash flow perspective, you're outlaying that cash, you know, six months before you're seeing it back in revenue. Um, So, when you launch product-based business, a lot of that investment goes straight to working capital. Um, other than that, we were pretty lean. So, you know, it was basically that and then setting it up in terms of branding website. But a lot of it was just done, you know, with myself. And then um, when we launched, we had a pretty good marketing budget essentially for launch. Um, and it was like six months worth of, well, like six to 12 months worth of runway, I think we thought is what we were going to get with that. Relative to where you are now, like when you go to the site, you've got bundles and a whole range of, of products. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, when they want to start something, they have this vision for a brand, which is like multiple products. We're about to launch a consumer pro- product in the beauty space, nothing near what you're doing, sort of for older dudes. But um, like you, we've got all these ideas for, you know, add on lines. So now you're down the road, you can see the full picture. But when you started, how broad was your um, your product range relative to where is it? where it is now it was small it was three products so we had um, a cleanser the hero product which was the spot treatment and then we actually had a cleansing like facial device and the reason why we actually did that was um and it was sort of almost like a classic marketing technique was giving people uh three options of bundles so you give them either all three products or you give them like the two main hero products, the cleanser and the spot treatment, or you give them, you know, the cleanser and the um, device like brush. And so it sort of gave them three different bundle options to choose from, which I actually like as a technique in terms of having like a high basket size, a middle one, and then a lower one, and then people can pick and they often go for the middle one. You can sort of direct that traffic where you want it to go. So, and then, you know, when you're launching, you're then not just launching with a single SKU. You've got these um, levers that you can pull to increase your average order size and sort of, um, you know, if you're going to play in e-commerce in beauty, you've got to weather a pretty high cost per acquisition. So you have to have the basket size there to do that. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because that's the real challenge with, you know, we get asked all the time, people have ideas for skin cares or protein powders and, and we're always like, how are you going to take it to market? Like, what is, do you know what your CPAs are? What's your average mm-hmm. order value? Have you got influencers involved? You know, these types of things because it's brutal out there. Like, what are you seeing as a cost per acquisition out there now for a cold acquisition? 
Oh, I mean, it, it changes all the time, but you're looking at upwards of $60 easily. Yes. So I want all the listeners out there that think I've got a $30 product or a $40 or $50 product, you, you know, that's that cost per acquisition. And this is a brand that's got some traction, has got some moat around it, has got some fame, like you've got 50,000 followers on Insta. So when you're just starting out and you may not have all those advantages, it may be even higher than what it is now. Yeah. Because I, I look on your website and you've got PR there, says that you're featured in Vogue and L and Mamma Mia and BuzzFeed. Like these are all things that you earn over time, right? So yeah. really bit really important. So how did you I think you guys can jump in with questions. Yep. I was just going to say, you know, how did you actually go to market? Yeah, well, if it's initial go to market, was there a a, a launch as uh, such with um, influencers um, to hit it with thud, or did you just go straight out with um, cold traffic? As you said, yeah, acquisition cost is about sixty bucks. Um, um, so, yeah. how, what did that look like? It was very small scale. So over the first, so when we basically the time from when we signed that agreement to then getting it to market was six months. It was pretty quick. Um, and so over that six month period, I organically built up a small following on Instagram just by bringing them behind the scenes of what was happening in the business. So when we launched in market, we had maybe like a thousand Instagram followers, but it was, you know, it wasn't nothing. And so that was the organic audience that I actually just launched to on launch day. There was no big influencer activity events, nothing. I mean, we were about to go into lockdown. So all of that stuff was being shut down anyway. Um, and so, yeah, it was really just basic organic Instagram activity at a very small scale paired with some meta ads with creative that I had created and I was placing the ads as well. Um, and so, you know, and we weren't spending much. It was maybe less than three grand a month on Facebook ads. And that was just the small scale way, way that we started to launch. And we didn't have any influencer activity because we'd only just gotten in the stock when we launched. So in terms of getting those influencers um, you know, on board, we had to seed out the products, get them trialing it, talk to management. Like those partnerships actually take a while to come to fruition. So the influencer marketing didn't kick in until maybe two to three months after the launch. And then that did really help as well. Increase the following of the brand, the credibility, brought us customers. Um, it brought us media as well. And so we started to learn that sort of this media paired with influencer activity that was really genuine, like they were really genuine fans of the brand, paired with, you know, some decent meta advertising um, started to really work to generate a solid customer base for us. With, with that, um, just going back to that, you, you, you acquire a client for $60. Um, Acne usually isn't a, a, um, in a, a one-month sort of term, as you said, you suffered for it for years. What would be the actual lifetime value of a client or, the, or the over what period of time would be the average? Is that two or three month client or that two or three year client? What does that look like? It's different for everyone, obviously, in terms of how long the products take to work on their skin. But I think having been the customer, what I really understood is that if you are someone that has suffered with breakouts and you then clear them, you'll do anything to make sure that you don't use anything that messes up your skin again. And so we were in a category that would be quite sticky if we did work for them. Like that loyalty is really high because it is so emotive. And so um, whilst they might only use the treatment product for three months, let's say, they're probably always going to have one on hand in their bathroom just in case they flare up again. And then they'll go to using all the other products in the range to maintain their skin to keep it clear. So that lifetime of the customer is actually pretty endless. And what we started seeing really early on was that the repetition of that customer base was really high. Um, and it was one of the most important pieces of data for us was that returning customer rate. And especially when it came to even talking to investors later on, because um, you know when you have that consumable business, it is so important if you're acquiring that customer at a really high cost per acquisition, you can potentially afford to lose money on that first um, purchase because you've got that lifetime value there and it shows scale, it shows pathway to profitability, it shows a lot of things when you can prove that retention in the business. Um, so yeah, very long way to answer that question, but it was a really important thing that we were able to keep those customers in. Yeah. And I, I don't want the listeners to miss what Rachel just said there, because 
we sort of teach people a 14 point blueprint when they want to know like what we look for in econ products or really any product but this is sort of like 14 things you don't have to have them all but like highly demonstrative visually demonstrative preferably because we we all can market our products now through these social media platforms which are all visual whether you're on tiktok mm -hmm. whether you're on instagram you've got a highly visual product you got somebody with acne there before and you got somebody with beautiful skin sitting right next to it if you have that problem you that that photo doesn't matter what language you speak you instantly get in a world that scrolls so quickly it, it'll stop the scroll and that's really really important so you've got a highly demonstrative visual product that if and it's a painful problem it's not just a pain point it's a it's literally painful physically on your skin so you got a highly demonstrative painful product that you solve and it's recurring and it would be high margin but being in this space most cosmetics are high margin which you need to acquire the customer in the first place and that recurring customer guys like if you if, if one of the greatest hacks in business if i'd learned it any sooner i would be further down the line is just how powerful that is from a cash flow point of view when you've got let's say a thousand customers and 200 of them come back next month to buy again without any acquisition cost that can make a massive difference you'll get to your financial goals so much quicker and the valuation of your company is way higher when you've got that recurring you know just look at bondi sands for example with a 56 times earnings exit in a private sale like 56 times um i the, the earnings crazy Eric, you must be an amazing spokesperson for the brand because for someone that has uh, or had acne, your your skin looks amazing. For anyone that's watching <laughs> this on YouTube, it's like it's like a porcelain <laughs> doll that skin. It's <laughs> um, been a long process. Trust yeah, me. I could imagine it's and what Adam said before the pain point. I had a friend that had very bad acne growing up. He was one of my best mates, and uh, not only the pain on the skin, but he had to take. Um, prescription medication that used to yeah. knock him out like he'd sleep for a long time throughout the day mm. just because of I guess the side effects from these medications so it's not just the actual side effects that you get from the pain on your face there's a lot of other side effects as well um, yeah. now I want to take you back to you've you've got this um, this agreement now and I look at your website and we look at the branding and we look at the Instagram and it's it's beautiful you know you've done such an amazing job where did that start? Who helped you with that? Did you work with a branding agency? How, how did you mm -hmm. come up with this idea and, and all the branding around it? Yeah, so we had the vision for the brand in terms of the name, um, the tone of voice. Like I think um, as a marketer myself, my strengths are probably in that copywriting brand tone of voice positioning um, area. But then we worked with a branding agency to bring it to life in terms of the visual identity so um, they did sort of the colours, um, the logo, the initial packaging mock-ups, um, and that was really great. I don't think we would have been able to do that and do it well without them. Um, so that was where we started back in the early day, and then really that just gave us the foundation to um, create those assets ourselves from there. And for the next two years, that was really how it worked. Um, we would design basically everything ourselves I'm saying ourselves but it was basically just me on graphic design canva tools and then I worked with a developer on the website and yeah it was it was small scale but without that foundational branding piece from that agency it would have been quite difficult and and what did that how long did that take and how much roughly did that cost do you remember it was about 10 grand and would have taken maybe a few weeks yeah and if you were to do it again would you spend that 10 grand over and over again or would you try and do it yourself because I think a lot of listeners mm -hmm. here, when when they're first starting out, everyone's trying to cut corners and trying trying to yeah. create brands themselves. And you've got stuff like you know ninety nine designs and all these types of online platforms that you can use. But how crucial was that ten grand using uh, paying that external agency? Yeah, I think hugely important. I mean, I look at my first pitch deck, which I designed myself, and it was hideous. So I don't, I wouldn't have wanted myself to be designing literally the core of the brand like to go through a rebrand is a really expensive process so to get that step wrong is costly later down the line and that was probably what I would say is yeah you want to be spending that money to get it right obviously make sure you're working with the right people um but yeah I think spend the money definitely in that area 
What does the uh, business look like from a revenue point of view from year one to year two to year three? What's your growth been over that time? Yeah, so year one uh, was probably about six fifty, um, six hundred fifty thousand in the year. Year two was um, flat, pretty much. But what did improve was the overall bottom line of the business and the margin. Still wasn't profitable, but we brought in other new products to the range with higher margins, um, and sort of just improved other things in the business to get. Um, that gross profit to a better place, which was some of the feedback actually that we'd had through first rounds of like early investment was your margins are going to have to be a bit higher to withstand, you know, retail channels down the line and you need a bigger range to be able to take to retail. So year two for the business was actually trying to just prep it a bit better for the next stage. So we were flat. Um, And then year three, I think was about two and a half to three mil. So a jump, a real jump. Um, then that went to year four, which we've just finished, and that was over ten million. Wow! Congratulations, that's amazing. What a journey! Thanks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good for you. And uh, you know, so few companies get into that eight-figure club, and um, that's a huge milestone. And well done, congratulations for you, Thanks. and also for your investors. So, so um, tell us about you. You mentioned investment. Uh, what has the journey been there? So you raised a couple of hundred grand in a line of credit initially. At what yeah. other points in the journey did you raise funding? How much and how did you do it? Yeah. So 18 months after launching, we then did a equity crowd fund raise. So we raised 467000 on a equity crowdfunding platform called Equitize. And that was the first sort of major round of investment that we did after launch. But through that first 18 months before we got to that stage, we did end up tipping extra money into the business in loans and other things just to keep it going. And then after that um, crowdfund, we launched a lot of the new products, which was great. It sort of gave us that ability to invest in new product and get – just the product range and the brand to a bit more of a um, mature stage in that it would then be ready to enter into retail and we could entertain other channels and look at that next stage of the business. And then that was, so that was October, 2021 when we did that equity crowd fundraise come probably July, the next year we decided, okay, we actually wanted to take on um, another round of investment. This time we really wanted advisory capacity to come in with that investment. So we were looking for money, but also expertise from people who had gone before us and done it. I mean, this was the first time that we'd launched an econ based business in beauty. Like we didn't have any connections into retail. We didn't have anything to sort of help us get to that next stage. And we recognized that and wanted to bring in those expertise to help us get there. Um, and so we started talking to a um, bunch of private equity, angel investors, a whole range of investors. And we were pitching for a while and 2022 was a really rough um, time in capital market. So um, it took a while for us to sort of get onto the right leads. And we got so close on so many deals that then would fall through at the last minute. And it's, it, I look back on that time and yeah, I wish I could have told myself what was coming because what happened was we spoke to private equity investors who actually introduced us to a business called Boost Lab that they had already invested in. They came in at the very start of that business. Hey guys, hope you're enjoying the pod. I just want to take a quick moment to share a quick story with you about something going on in one of my businesses right now. We are using artificial intelligence to send a voice clone of myself directly into our customer's voicemail inboxes the moment after they purchase our product. Well, not the moment, a few minutes after. So with our toilets business, Dry Flush, people put in their name, their email, their phone number, when they order the toilets, five minutes later, there's a their phone rings once and it goes straight to their voicemail. And we're using an AI that clones my voice and says, hey, Terry, if that's their name, grabbing the name from the order form using my voice, it drops a customized voicemail to say, hey, Terry, what's going on? Adam here from Dry Flush. Just want to say thank you so much for ordering one of our toilets. Sorry, I missed you. I just wanted to let you know that we appreciate your business. If there's anything you need, just send us an email at hello at dryflush.com.au. And that goes out to every customer every time a few minutes after the purchase. This is what the team at earlybird.ai 
are building for us right now, as along with some other very, very cool solutions that are going to increase customer experience, increase the number of five-star reviews we get and automate the amazing experience that we are aiming to provide when you buy from our e-commerce store. So if you want to learn about that and your business is doing over half a million dollars a year, you qualify for a free audit with the team at earlybird.ai. That's E-A-R-L-I, earlybird.ai. And they will do an order to your business and show you how they can put artificial intelligence like that into your business, whether it's voice cloning, video face cloning, all kinds of amazing technologies that are available right now. So go over there, get your free audit and enjoy the rest of the podcast. It had also launched in 2020, that brand. It was a range of serums that was stocked in Priceline, founded um, by a husband and wife team, Craig, who was one of those founders, has been through many beauty businesses before and built brands himself and exited them. Um, And so he was more seasoned, obviously, than we were. And they said, look, you're actually looking at your business model and your numbers and we can see a lot of real like compliments between the two businesses. Um, You should meet with Craig and just, you know, have a chat about whether there's something you could do together. And we met with Craig and it was um, really funny because we had spoken to so many investors that looked at the numbers and they loved what we were doing, but they were like, you know, you just need to get to, you know, you need to get to 5 million revenue and then we'll invest. And it's like, we need cash to be able to do that. And um, Craig was sort of the first person he saw, he looked at the numbers and he looked at the repeat numbers and everything. And and he looked at how much we'd spent to get to where we were. And he was like, wow, I don't know how you've done this. Cause it's so hard. Like it was someone on the inside who almost really understood what we were dealing with, with such limited capital. So he looked at it and, and loved what we were doing and could see the synergies then in terms of the Boost Lab side. They were really strong in terms of their retail presence. They understood, you know, Craig's obviously really seasoned. He understood how to raise, how to properly fund the businesses, how, you know, he was even experienced in terms of export markets. So we started to see a lot of alignment in that they actually didn't have that e-com digital marketing piece down. Um, and they didn't have an internal finance head, which was what the expertise we had on our side. And we didn't have that retail understanding and sort of that commercial experience. So we decided to merge. Um, and we went through that merger. It took a long time to pull together, but we completed the merger in March 2023 and came together. By that stage, we'd already pitched into Priceline in August of 2022. Um, so we were already halfway through that process with Priceline they came into the final stages of that discussion with that retailer, made sure that it got across the line um, and they were really helpful in just, you know, going into those conversations and not knowing what you're doing. It's very, very difficult to make sure you get the outcome that you want. So they were great in just supporting us through the end stages of that. We took on their e-commerce, their brand positioning, all of their marketing um, and it was literally a match made in heaven. So then from March 2023, both of the, since then, both the businesses have basically scaled by four to five times, both businesses individually. And ours has come majorly, um, you know, TBH's side was really through retail, um, pr- that um, retail presence and distribution. And um, Boost Labs was actually through e-commerce growth and sort of um, brand repositioning. It was very interesting. It's super. I'm just looking at their website, boostlabco.com. That's- yeah. Yeah, that's right. Wow, what a synergy. There's so much I want to dive into here. Um, this is such I, I did. It's funny how, you know, I've read a couple of your news stories and looked at your Instagram, but then when you scratch the surface a little, there's so much more. Like where yeah. Yeah, it's got a, quite a big e-com business. Um, they're at about a hundred million a year now. And I, wow. we, we haven't interviewed Eric really deeply enough because I'd love to hear your stories when I hear all these amazing stories. It's just incredible. So, so let's just, if you don't mind, um, just sharing a couple of the things here. Um, like I'm always amazed when I get someone like you on, like there's the four levels of learning and the highest level is consciously, uh, sorry, unconsciously competent, which means you're really, really good at what you're doing. And most people who are really, really good at what they're doing, forget, uh, all the skills and things that they've learned along the way. And you're talking about going to private equity. You don't look like you're even 30 yet. And you, you know, you're doing this stuff in your twenties, right? Like most people don't even know what private equity means. And here you are going around Sydney, pitching to private equity, 
<laughs> so, you know, what, what is, what, can you just explain to the listener, what is a private equity firm? I mean, we know what it is, but what, what is a private equity firm and how do you get a meeting with them and why were you getting a meeting, trying to get meetings with them? Well, I mean, I mean, it's a good question. I'll probably butcher explaining what a private <laughs> equity firm is, but um, corporate yeah, basically right? they, yeah, they're corporate investors that hold different funds that basically invest in a range of businesses and they're get aiming, aiming to get a return on that fund for the people who have been invested in it. Um, so usually when, you know, when you're working with private equity, there's an understanding that there's going to be a return on that investment in a certain period of time. Um, which I think is something that you really need to consider when you do partner with private equity over the long term is, um, you know, they, they're looking for that return um, and usually within a designated period of time. Um, but, yeah, I think in terms of how we ended up meeting with private equity, it actually came from the days of the crowdfunding. We ended up meeting with private equity sort of along that journey. Along the way, there were some private equities that took an interest in what we were doing and had a look into the business and there were some that actually got quite close to investing and they were the ones that sort of fell through after that process and we'd get to even term cheat stage sometimes and then it would fall over. Um, and so every conversation with one investor ended up leading to a conversation with another person that would then lead to a conversation with another investor. And so we just welcomed any opportunity and any conversation that really came in the door and we spoke to everyone um, and we we spoke to VCs occasionally, um, but yeah, it was a really good learning curve. I think every single time I pitched, I would come out and change the pitch deck in some way for the next one. So by the end of that whole process, you know, we we became pretty aware of how to pitch and what questions were coming our way. Yeah, it was a good learning process. When you say we, I mean, with the start of the pod, we talked about your mum being involved. Yeah. Is she still yeah. fairly active involved with you? Is she going along to these pitches yeah. as well? Like what's what's her yes. role now um, yeah. in, in the company? Yeah. So she's actually the CFO. I'm the CMO in York Street Brands. So we're still working together and she would come into those meetings with me. I would typically pitch, um, you know, pitch the brand, the growth plan, the overall sort of model of the business but then um you know she's such a important part like without if you don't know your numbers and you don't know your finance and you don't know your data you don't really know anything so she is um literally a genius in terms of having those numbers down and I've never seen anyone work an excel spreadsheet like she can but she will build you know she built those forecasts that we were pitching to those investors from bottom up they were all based on you know the buying behaviors of the cohorts that had come before us and they were like the most detailed forecast you'd ever seen so the minute someone questioned us on our numbers or anything like that you know we we knew exactly what we were talking about so when I say we I mean we sort of went in as a team where I was pitching more creative vision for the brand and the you know who we were targeting and how we were doing it the marketing side and then she would come in and really um, you know, go into the details and the numbers and the, and how the, you know, business operationally ran as well. I can just imagine the two of you be such a formidable force because you're like really <laughs> connected to the customer and that generation. And then mama bear comes in and she's just a killer <laughs> on the spreadsheets. Like that, yeah. you would have been like a, just I, I, a friend of mine, he's quite a wealthy guy and he invests in businesses and he just invested in a hair care business out of Sydney. And, uh, you know, they put in decent money and he said it was just these two girls came in and I, I don't really know much about what their stuff is all about but I just believed you them <laughs> they were just killers and so we put in some money and it's all, that personality and belief goes such a long way that's uh, really cool I, I I love the deal that that you did with with Craig because um we've uh, got a coaching cohort and we uh, a couple weeks ago when they were asking about partnering with people and how to look for business partners and what to look for, I mentioned three things. I said, you know, you've got knowledge and skills, you've got financial capacity, and then you have a network. And if you could find someone that can bring all three, you know, your business can really, you know, scale quite quickly. Obviously, yeah. Craig sounds like he brought all three. And it really sounds yeah. like you brought two things. You brought the knowledge and skills and the network to his side of the business, right? Obviously he had the financial mm -hmm. capacity because he didn't have the e-com side. So you pumped his yeah. side of the business and he's brought you guys into retail with those three, you know, knowledge, skills, yeah. financial capacity and network. And 
to me, that that is a, a an amazing recipe because it's you can go and get money, right? But you still got to yeah. know what to do with the money. And obviously, exactly. Craig has really helped you with that by the sounds of it. I don't yeah. Th- and I think as well, Rachel, like again, for the listeners, I don't want you to miss, there's so much wisdom here that's just being shared without it being highlighted. It's So Rachel did a crowdfunding through this platform that led to discussions with private equity firms that were monitoring the platforms for leads probably right like let's keep on on who's raising some funds and let's look at some stories some of them reached out to you and then one of them introduced you to a client that they'd invested in called boost labs which led to a relationship which merged and don't miss what you said four or five x both businesses that's unbelievable you're talking about I mean, if you're doing 10 million in revenue, you're talking about multi eight figure of value creation through that one relationship, right? Um, yeah. In terms of what the businesses have grown in terms of equity, if you look at comps in the marketplace today, can you just mm-hmm. unpack a little bit about just that journey of building a relationship with Craig? Because the it was mm-hmm. it Craig? Craig. Craig, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. you can read a business book and many of them are high level, but like granular, you get referred, you get an email introduction, I imagine, from a PE guy or girl that says, hey, Craig, you should meet Rachel and her mom. Go and have a coffee. What actually happened? Did you go have a coffee? How did you build that relationship? Because for many people, they just don't know what they're supposed to do like, and how long yeah. did it take before you went, somebody had the idea to say, hey, maybe we should merge. So what was that journey like and how close were the businesses in terms of size when you merged? Very close um, in terms of size. Boost Lab was bigger in terms of their distribution, but actually, like, it wasn't too far off in yeah. terms of um, the actual revenue size of the businesses. Um, but yeah, there's that initial introduction. I think he came into our offices, and I think we sat in a meeting room for about two hours. And Bridget, who's my mum, had all of her, her Excel spreadsheets up on the, well, on the screen and, and we were <laughs> going through them and I think we were just explaining to each other how our different businesses were working and set up and the different challenges that they were facing and I think it just became really apparent that we could be of major help to each other. I think he could see that we were really strong e-com marketers and obviously we had all of our numbers in place um, and, yeah, I think he, he saw – he was the first – person I think we spoke to that really he was like you're just missing money is what he said like you just need cash um and then this business is away and I think it was we hadn't had that real belief I think in like the business and the model and someone who would just come in and so you know so immediately just say well all you're missing is cash um you know I think we we needed a Craig in our lives to push us he's more of a he has more risk appetite than we do. I think it gave us a lot of confidence. So, yeah, he came in. We had like a two-hour discussion. I think the next week we met again. The week after that we met again. Um, we knew pre- pretty quickly that Craig was someone that we liked. Like, you know, I think you can get a sense for a person pretty quickly. Um, obviously, doing a merge is a very risky thing. You're tying your business to someone else. Those things can go bust all the time because of personality differences and different ways of working. So, well, we had a really good feel for Craig early on. We really liked him. Um, and then essentially, we just started looking like uh, at what it would look like to work together. And we both wanted to build very similar teams internally. So, it was like, you know, we were both going on this same path and instead of going and building the exact same thing individually, we just decided to come together and build it together and that in, in itself achieved major efficiencies for both of the business in being able to leverage one team across two brands um, and sort of pull all these, in, yeah, all these expertise in-house and just build this engine that could then build these brands and the, and the revenue streams of the, of the brands. So... Yeah, I think when we came together, yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, did you actually move in together? I mean, physically, like as in, so the two companies actually merged in physical, same offices. Yeah. So we set up a new, yeah, we set up a new parent company called York Street Brands and took out offices on York Street. It was a bit of a rush naming of the brand, but it works. Um, And so, yeah, we found this office on York Street, took it out, named the new parent company York Street Brands now owns both Boost Lab and TBH. We all took out new equity in the parent company. So it was a there was no cash exchange in that deal. It was script for script and we basically took new equity in that parent company. 
Um, so we all own, yeah, basically now York Street Brands, which houses these two businesses. And um, when we came together, we came together in March, we finished the financial year. There was already some really quick wins that came through um, for both the brands in that first sort of four-month period. But we finished FY23 at about five mil. We just finished FY24 over 21 mil. As a combined. So, yeah. And yeah. you guys. That's amazing. I love it. Well done. And what's your role in that business now, in the parent company? Well, what's your data? My role, yeah, my role is now in the CMO role, which I love. Um, so Craig has taken on the CEO role. I took on the CMO role and Bridget took on the CSO role. Um, the company, when we came together, had a few sort of part-time people. I had like one part-timer in the marketing team and a consultant and then they had like a um, operations coordinator and a head of sales and an innovation um, head as well who was doing all their formulation. So all together, the team was about eight people when we came together and merged and moved into the offices. And today it's now 27 people. 16 of those people are in marketing. Um, so it's become this beast, like literally within 12 months. Um, but I love my job day to day now. I feel like I'm finally doing the stuff that I'm meant to be doing and that I'm actually good at. So, so 27 people and 16 of those people are just in marketing. Yeah. So basically you guys are just a marketing machine, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, like businesses within businesses, right? Like our Mozzie says that. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. For those wanting to look at your branding, guys, um, you can check the Instagram TBH skincare underscore just to get a handle on their branding. Have you got a little bit more time or if you got to run or? Um, yeah, no, I've got some more time. Yeah, because uh, this is just such a great pod because it's obviously on the back of a, a really successful brand that's growing really well, but there's so much, there's a few more things I'd love to talk to you about. Um, the reason I encourage people to jump on the Insta is because I see Craig on there um, and you guys taking the piss and giving him a hard time and different things, which is great to see. <laughs> yeah. So you can actually get a real insight. What I love about about your Instagram is it it really is inside the brand. There's almost mm -hmm. no photos of your product. It's just all about you crazy <laughs> lot doing your stuff in York Street. You know, you actually get a sense of yeah. the people behind the business, which is wonderful. Um, yeah. So um, what, what I wanted to ask you about is just some of the practical things like you've, you've, you've done a deal with Priceline, you've done a deal with, with the Matildas, you know, you've got... Um, some really enviable PR like Vogue and L and stuff like that. Can you just sort of speak to maybe, let's just talk quickly about, let's say Priceline. What's like, how do you get into a big retailer like that? What's the first step to doing that? Who's the person or how do you find the person that you need to reach out to and what's the process? Well, I found buyers on LinkedIn. That's where I started was I found the category buyer um, at Priceline on LinkedIn and started messaging them. Um, I eventually then got an email for that person. I emailed them. I sent samples to their offices. Um, and so sometimes, I mean, I've, I've never heard of anyone getting a super quick reply from someone like a price line. They get so many inbounds all the time of people wanting to be stopped. And they're also operating on certain range review timelines that they're trying to hit. So you sometimes don't have a gauge of when you should be hearing back from them by. Um, but I think we were very lucky in that we also um, had a franchise owner actually at one of the stores um, of a price line who was able to introduce us to the category buyer as well and loop us in in an email. And that was actually where we got our first bite back from the buyer where um, she came back and said, cool, um, I'd love to hear your pitch and booked us in for a meeting. Um, and that was in their range review timeline cycles, which we didn't know at the time, but they only have two a year where they entertain new brands. So if you're talking to them outside of that, you're often not going to hear back because they're just not looking at new brands. And so, um, yeah, we pitched then and, and then went through a few more meetings and actually went and saw them in person in Melbourne and then, yeah, basically got the sign off to, to be stocked in the stores. How do you, um like uh, for a business like yours in the, in the obviously to start with it was all direct to consumer now yeah. you've got a, re, a wholesale side to to retailers how do you see the like the bigger players in the space that you're being guided by and mentored by like how do you see um the retail component as a mix of the overall picture for you going forward yeah i think a lot of people see retail almost as a competing channel to online and i think we take quite a different philosophy in York Street brands as a whole. 
um, where I see the retailers as a really important brand partner for brand building. And so when we, you know, we went after Priceline because we felt that it matched the mission of TBH Skincare so well in that it was that pharmacy level, it was accessible, it was affordable, there was a healthcare practitioner in store, but it was still this beauty destination and we felt like we could actually really bring something new to their category. And so I think when you can see what the vision is for you, but also for that retailer and how you play into that, it's a really important part of partnering with them. And then when we did launch, we, you know, we were so proud to be partnered with Priceline. We talked about it for days. We ran a lot of marketing around it. And I think it made for a really quick, successful partnership with them where we also then sort of got them on board because they could see the impact of what we were doing. And yes, it cannibalized some of our D2C sales, but the overall gain of the customers we reached and the scale we achieved far outweighed any of that. And so that's always been our approach is everything we do in marketing is always an omni-channel effect. It's not just to gain D2C or be combative on our e-commerce against what the retailers are doing. It's very much like how can we make them work together for the benefit of everyone in that ecosystem. And it was the same when we took on Coles as a second retailer was, you know, we really firmly believed that that was a bit of a different customer that we would add to the partnership with Priceline and with, you know, the overall brand mission and values. Um, And again, we didn't see cannibalization. We actually just saw growth across all channels. So I think when you can approach it like that, but it's up to the brand to take real ownership for what happens on shelf in that retailer. I think a lot of people think put it on the shelf, it'll sell because customers will come in and pick it up. It doesn't work like that. You have to work just as hard for that sale on the retail shelf as you do for the ones on your e-com store and you should care equally, I think, about both. What does working hard for it on a retail shelf mean? I've, I would imagine in my head if I've got a shelf, my stuff goes in there and they put it on the shelf. How can you influence that at the retail level? I think, you know, there's people, there's a few different ways, but any marketing that we do, we're not just driving people to the e-com store. We're often driving people in store to Priceline. We're partnering with certain influencers that won't actually do activity that link back to our website. They'll be going into store and shopping it in those retail partners. And that's, you know, driving it, that's driving revenue for the retailer. Yes, we might be losing margin on that, but we think that's part of like, building that retailer into our brand story and sort of, yeah, the overall customer experience. And then there's also that element of, you know, Priceline, it, it, they have beauty advisors in their store and those beauty advisors are the customers themselves. And so getting their buy-in, the staff's buy-in, uh, the people who are going to, you know, there's someone that walks into the store and they say, what do I pick up for, you know, breakouts? If you can get to that person who's then going to be selling someone in the store and convince them of your brand and your story and get their buy-in that's such an important and powerful part of also moving product in that retailer we invested in that as well yeah okay so you're talking about driving your traffic to their outlets how many outlets have you got between coles and priceline selling your product today like is it is it hundreds or roughly like what over 1200 doors okay between the two priceline and coles Mm -hmm. What yeah. what what's uh, the percentage of sales from e-com and retail? Seventy percent retail, thirty percent e-com for TBH. Wow. wow! So look at that, eh? Like partnering with Craig. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah, <laughs> and Boost Lab actually, wow. um, Boost Lab's now become heavier on e-coms. So they're fifty-five percent e-com, forty-five percent retail. And was there like a price point? Like I think the thing is when you go into a price line. You can't really have a really super high price point, right? Like I look at High Smile, who are very successful, but their price points are really low. Is it sort of mm-hmm. similar when you go into Priceline? There's sort of a limit to where you can sort of charge for your tonics and serums? Yeah, I think so. And especially if you're a small player, like you need to encourage that initial adoption. So if, if price is going to be a really big barrier to then someone trialing your product, like that's going to make it really hard for you to just cut through and get that traction and compete on shelf. So unless you have really big brand equity to essentially outweigh the price and convince people to spend that and trust in that, then you have to be able to to not necessarily like underprice people, but you just have to be comparable enough that it's not a super big risk or big barrier for that customer to 
branch out and try something new. Interesting. So you've got um you've now had this um fantastic relationship mer- through the merger. You've got um and you are obviously omnipresent here. We've got retail and you've got ecom. And I think your words were you've now got an engine with York Street Brands. Now we have to go into the in the short and near term. What's what's the the vision with York Street Brands being plural, being brands? Is it to launch more brands or is it to um just scale the the crap out of these two current ones you've got? Yeah, I think months with the growth we've been doing a lot of catching up in just in terms of even structures you know we had to implement a massive erp system net suite like there were all of these things that we were missing because we were startup founder-led businesses with not a lot of process and structure that then we were dealing with you know all of these different channels to businesses like the financial side of that was very complicated so the last 12 months have been trying to manage the growth even inventory-wise, air freighting out constantly, you know, packaging to keep up with supply, trying to increase the forecast and the demand that then still weren't enough for what came through. So I would call it chasing our tail massively for the last 12 months. We haven't really been able to look ahead. I think only now we've gotten those processes in place and we feel like we've caught up and we can go again. So I think next is really looking at, okay, what other growth can we now ride with these two brands that have great momentum in the market at the moment? How can we capitalize on that? You know, there's TBH Skincare, when you look at the revenue um, that it's delivering in the retailer versus the percentage of shelf space it has is starkly different. So for us, you know, we still have quite a small range. I think it'll be about expanding that, bringing in new products, um, you know, even um, that might be the case as well for Boost Lab. And so it's that looking at other markets because we haven't really touched any international markets in a meaningful way yet. So looking at both of that for the brands and then looking at ways that now we've set up this, you know, team and system in-house, how can we potentially leverage that across other brands? That might be acquisitions um, or it could be building again ourselves. But I would say that we're only really just getting to a place now where we're starting to entertain what's next because it has been majorly just playing catch up. With your funding, I think you, you said that you've done a first round, which is family friends, then you raised 467 through Equitize. Uh, has there been other funding along the way since then um, into the business or has it just been self-funded internal cash flow? Um, so when we merged with Boost Lab, that was off the back of a raise. So that was the other part of funding that came in after the equitized raise from then it's been um, we haven't needed other investments. So um, essentially both of those businesses turned profitable and the business is is humming now, um, which is, yeah, it's a very new place to be in obviously when you've been used to burning through cash every month. So Boost Labs have just done a raise, right, with the private equity? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, in well, that was back in March 2023 when that completed. Okay. So when we came together to merge, they had done a five million dollar raise. Right. Yeah. So the two entities came together. Then now you've got this shared resource of cash, um, which is uh, able to. It makes such a difference once you've got product market fit and you've found that thing. So many great yeah. lessons. And again, also guys, make sure you drop over and check out their Insta because there's really great example of great branding there. I love how you've built a community and I think there's there's so much there to be learned because it is such an emotive topic for the end user and how you call yeah. your clients spotty hotties which is really <laughs> sweet it's a lovely it's a lo- you know it's a lovely way to connect with it and the double mm. entendre and your name tbh to be honest right like you're talking about something very emotional is it like mostly females or a split even between the two um, in your brand? No, it's mostly females. Yeah. We've seen more males, like younger males actually coming through now and often like via their moms or um, sisters or whoever. But, um, yeah, it's sort of actually evening out a bit more these days. In the, in the early days, it was very female-focused. And we did that quite intentionally because, you know, when you're operating in a saturated category with a small amount of budget, you almost need to pick that niche and that customer and just go after that one person. So that was the strategy in the early days. You've done a great job of building community. Your brand is just, uh, it's it's on point. You know, get over there and check it out, the website and the and the brand. Uh, you guys got any other questions before we? Uh... I just had one more. Was there a particular reason you guys raised money through crowdfunding for that 467 rather than private or like a private investor or an angel investor? 
I think at the time we probably didn't think we were ready for more sophisticated investment. So we wanted the ability to sort of raise that cash and then have real autonomy with how we used it and what we put it towards. Um, And so, yeah, I would say that was probably the main reason. And just because we didn't feel like we were big enough at that stage, it was really hard. We were really small. So to actually have the interest of a private equity was pretty much impossible um, and then to, I mean, some of the private equities, they've got like these incubator funds. So sometimes you can get into that when you're early stage, but then, yeah, it was just basically, it was the easiest way for us to find that network of people and raise that cash, I would say at that stage in business. Yeah. Go check it out guys. If you haven't seen these equity funding platforms, they can be a really, really great way. And you can often get your own customers investing in, did yeah. you, you would have got that, I imagine, quite a few of your customers. Yeah, like, we yeah, did. I want to, because they can invest like 20 bucks sort of stuff, right? Like small amounts too. Yeah, yeah you can pick your minimums. I think ours was 250 but we had customers coming in investing. Look, we've learned so much from you and it's just amazing that, uh, you know, we've got folks like you willing to come on and just be so open with your story. Um, as I said to you off camera before we started rolling, we, we try to think of the young um, Rachel who's, 21 years old on her way to a job somewhere and trying to figure out, but she feels ambitious and um, like there's more in her than just working in a job. Maybe she's got a mum who's a fiend on the spreadsheets as well. <laughs> um, and just really thinking about that young man and woman and, and how we can best serve them. That's why we exist here at Unemployable to help people with that ambition and drive and just sense that there's more. And um, I just really want to say thank you, uh, Rachel, to you uh, for being so willing first to come on and then second so open about mm. about your journey it's um uh, one thing i noticed you know like your, your your whole approach to business is quite open so many people would have said oh, i'll meet with craig but only under a non-disclosure and a non-compete and da 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 whereas you sort of took a very open approach and it's paid off really well for you and i think we can all learn from that uh, we can't wait to read about you in the financial review when some big cosmetic company comes along and gobbles you up for mega millions and um, and, and you become an inspiration even more than you are and, and, and the team. So we'll be watching. So is there anything that our followers uh, should do to follow you or where, where do you want to direct their attention if they've really resonated um, with you today? Oh, I would say we, you know, we mainly engage with our customers now, um, community online by Instagram and TikTok. So they would be the places I would send them to. And that would be for, for TBH or either or, right? Um, um, yeah, that would be for TBH, Boost Lab, probably Instagram. Yeah. Instagram. And it's, uh, you can look at both Boost Lab, uh, boostlabco.com and, uh, and also tbhskincare.com. So go check it out. Uh, it's been fantastic. Thank you for coming on, Rachel. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, if you know any other young founders like you that are crushing it out there, we'd love to have them on the pod as well if you've enjoyed being here. So uh, Thank would, you so much. No worries. Thanks for coming, Rachel, and have a beautiful day. You too. Thank you. Bye. Hey there. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Unemployable. If you'd like to watch another episode, just click there.